Welcome to Silicon Curtain. It's my delight today to welcome Joseph Lindsley to the channel. He is the only American reporter who has been reporting every day from Ukraine. Uh, many of you will know him. If you don't, I strongly advise you follow his material. It's extraordinary. It really cuts through the Russian BS. There's no propaganda narratives there. And there's really deep analysis uh, of what's going on. Of course, Joseph is very close to US politics as well. So you'll get a lot of stuff about what is going on in the US, the election, how that is going to affect things, especially in relation to Ukraine. Now, this is going to be the first of a series of monthly conversations. And the the aim is to try and bring you right up to the front line to give you an impression of what's going on in Ukraine, politics, military, society, resilience, and of course, to uncover those stories, which unfortunately, the mainstream media either ignore or distort. Um, before we jump in, please also do check out the list of verified Ukrainian charities that are in the description of this video. It's never been more important to support the incredible work that Ukrainian charities are doing, both on the front line, but also in helping veterans, people who have become disabled through the war, get them reintegrated. Many actually rejoin the army in various capacities, but we also have civilian charities there, especially in Kharkiv, uh, a, a wonderful charity set up by a uh, British academic that is rebuilding the houses of people that have been damaged and destroyed. That's never more important than the winter. It's an absolutely inspiring charity. So please do check all those out. And of course, Joseph, you are in Kharkiv. Jonathan, yes. Hello from Kharkiv. And uh, it's been uh, pretty noisy here lately. And, uh, I, you know, since December 28th, uh, that, that's when Russia began its latest sort of spate of serious attacks. And they've really been pounding the city. Uh, I spent a lot of time here in 2023. And I saw the city come back to life. Uh, and, and shops are opening, uh, restaurants were coming, you know, reopening after, you know, they've been closed since the beginning of the full scale invasion and people were returning here. And I was gone since uh, during the month of December. And when I wanted to come back, when I saw what was happening here several times a week, uh, very intense attacks. In fact, on one night, there were 23 missiles in a night uh, here in the center of the city. And it's it's I mean, the bill, it's been transformed structurally. Uh, everywhere you go, you can see the damage and the destruction, but there's traffic, uh, there's people everywhere. And so people are not fleeing. And so I wanted to be here uh, in this time. I was thinking as I was taking the train from relatively safe Lviv, uh, you know, what am I doing, <laughs> you know, coming here to, to the edge? Uh, and uh, I, but this is, uh, Kharkiv is, for, for, for me, it's, I mean, we're 30 miles or so from the border with Russia. And this is the, this is where things are extremely clear. Uh, and uh, this is, I, I call it, the, I was thinking when I was on the train, you have, you know, the two opposite ideologies. That, that's what this war really is, right? It's Russia, which is, you know, the, the society of tyranny and, and vertical, you know, top-down control. And Ukraine is deeply horizontal. It, it is a fierce democracy. And I think everyone else in the world, with all of our political debates, whether it's in Germany or the UK or the US, we're somewhere on the spectrum between what Ukraine is and what Russia is, what those two ideas represent. And I think the more people realize this, the more they'll see why this matters. And, and so that's why I wanted to, to be here in Kharkiv, which I see as the, the pole of uh, freedom and dignity uh, and, and of, of champions, of heroes, of angels. And just not, you know, just a few miles away is, is the pole of exactly the opposite, uh, of tyranny, of demons, uh, and, 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 and uh, of, of, a, of a desire to uh, to to control people and, and and when I say demons I mean it because I, I feel I mean especially the, this past several nights uh, you know we, we the the Russians have you know continued to rain hell down upon this city and um, uh, I, I thought Jonathan it might be helpful as we have these monthly conversations to do some quick hits to give people a little bit of a feel you know what it's been like here recently and I, I was thinking you know what. What is it? You get used to things, right? But I, I was saying, what has been my scariest uh, moment? And uh, no matter how you get used to, how much you get used to things, there's still things that you know sort of shock you. And on Tuesday morning, uh, the Russians, well, we knew that there were, uh, an attack was en route. Uh, about twelve bombers were in the sky. You know, sort of scary to read this stuff. And uh, we we knew this at about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, ETA was somewhere around six a.m. Okay, you got three hours. You know, what, what do you do during that time? Uh, and we had multiple air raid alarms during that time. And we had an all clear at 4 a.m. 
And so you think, okay, a few minutes a piece, seconds after the all clear, six rockets uh, hit the city, the, the, the suburbs, uh, the north, all, purely residential area. Uh, and once that finished, you still knew that, you know, the main attraction was still on the way in just a couple of hours. And that was another very intense attack in the morning. Uh, but in a sense, you're used to it, right? And then so that evening, you know, I, like everyone else, was exhausted. I had been uh, sleeping, like many people here, uh, in the bathroom uh, for, 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 for the whole time I've been here. Uh, you can feel it in your back. And, uh, and I just said, I'm going to lie down in the bed in my flat here and uh, at 9 o'clock at night and just get some rest. And all of a sudden, you know, I didn't know if I was dreaming or what, but there was this intense, I just felt something intense. And I wake up and I don't know what's happening. And uh, I could feel the shockwave. Uh, and I'm scrambling in the fog of my, you know, uh, deep sleep to figure out what's going on. My heart's racing. And then once again, it hits even closer. You know, you just feel like th th this evil presence is getting closer and closer to you. And I ran down to, to the shelter in the building in my socks, you know, and, and, and it was um, in the soul. In a sense, you you get used to it, but never really. And you just feel like it's it, 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 like it feels demonic, you know, when you the, the fact that you would rain this hell upon such a lovely civilian city. It's the closest we, we come. I say we because I'm in Oxford and we demonstrably don't have missiles raining down on us. And I think a lot of people like to sort of really forget it and not think about it. You know, it's terrible. It's over there. It's somewhere else. But I think for those who are watching what's going on and reading about these reports, there is still a kind of visceral nature then. It's the closest we'll come to, I guess, what my grandparents experienced during the London Blitz. Um, the knowledge that there is a malign force uh, on the continent sending these instruments of death and putting so much energy, so much resource, uh, so much material into, into killing and destruction and a desire to control you. I think that is, that's the other aspect, isn't it? Yeah, this, it's a desire to, to control. And it's, you know, Ukrainians don't, I mean, as I, you know, after, so the next morning after that attack, I'm, I'm walking around the city uh, and, you, I mean, it's incredible. You know, if ever I think anyone who loses their courage or metal about this uh, in uh, in Washington or faraway places, you don't have to come all the way to Kharkiv, but it is helpful because you get encouraged. You get encouraged just by walking the streets after an attack. Uh, people are calm and cheerful because they 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 already know who they are. The Ukrainians do not. And by the way, many people in Kharkiv who were born in Russia, but their their identity is Ukrainian because they insist on living. Uh, and freedom. And they don't want, you know, especially now, you, why would you want to live in a society that treats people uh, the way that Russia does? And I, uh, I, I think that this is, uh, this is what, this is a frustration, a big frustration I have, because I, I look at, uh, we have this strange thing in some of our American discourse right now, where, um, like, for example, there's great praise for protest, uh, in, uh, farmers protest in Germany, uh, there's great solidarity. I saw Elon Musk and Conor McGregor talking on X about, you know, oh, we stand, we're fighting with the Irish people and their great fight for, for something. Um, uh, we're fighting, you know, with, like, in, in America, we can sort of uh, identify culture wars within a country. We're like, oh, yeah, we're going to, we use the word fight. We're going to fight with you, stand for freedom. And uh, again, they're talking about, uh, I saw Jordan Peterson yesterday talking about the Ottawa truckers movement from a couple of years ago. And what amazes me is that, fine, praise all these little movements, but they missed the biggest protest movement of our generation, which was Ukraine's you made the Don revolution. And, and it's because of that, that this war is happening. Uh, and and I, I feel that deeply here. And I, I, I went to, uh, I, I knew that one of the places, the, the block that had been hit uh, in that attack that woke me up, uh, they, they hit one of the oldest, most beautiful historic buildings in Kharkiv. And on that same block was, is a coffee shop I go to all the time. And I, I went there uh, at eight o'clock in the morning. Just I just I wanted to see what had happened. And amazingly, it was open. And uh, there's people of all different ages uh, sweeping up debris. Uh, they're giving free coffee to rescue workers and people who lost their homes. And uh, and the 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 girls in their twenties who work there are just I was shocked. They were cheerfully just pouring coffee. Uh, people are buying coffee for future guests that might come in, paying it forward. Uh, they they were boarding up the windows. And uh, my friend Gamut, who's a, a Ukraine's Banksy, 
uh, except he's not anonymous like Banksy, but he, uh, he, he paints murals, especially here in Kharkiv, to boost people's spirits. And he had gone there just a few minutes after the attack. And, and he, uh, maybe we can share this, but he had painted, uh, uh, painted wards uh, on one of the boarded up windows uh, of this cafe. And, and the idea is, is hard to translate directly, uh, but he was saying uh, in, in the twilight, uh, you can hear a reassuring understatement. And I said, Gamut, what, Hamlet, Gamut, uh, so what does that mean? Um, and he says, you know, these, these, there's beautiful big windows. By the way, I, I would sit there all the time and the table where I sat was blown away. Um, and uh, Gamlet said, these huge windows, they created an atmosphere as though you were on the street and you could see everything, uh, you know, especially on a sunny day. You could, you could just see the city and see every bit of life. And he said, but sometimes when there's too much sunshine, uh, every, you, you miss the, the essence of things. There's too much to take in. And, and so in this very Ukrainian way, uh, finding the positive even in the, uh, in the destruction. And so he said, you know, now this coffee shop is cozier. And he said, uh, just like when the sky is overcast, colors are muffled, shadows disappear, and the essence of things is exposed. Uh, and, 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 and that's really what I feel as I walk around the city. It, you, the, you know, every, I mean, it, it's scary and terrifying, but you don't see anyone saying time to run away. Uh, you see the resolve is, you know, they have, t everyone has moist, teary eyes, but the resolve is, is ever stronger uh, to keep going uh, no matter what. And, and that's, uh, and, and Jonathan, even like, I, I go back to that coffee shop all the time and, and stepping over glass or whatever, no one even really talks about it. It just, <laughs> Hey, how are you? Oh, normal. <laughs> this incredible spirit. And that's it. And even in the diaspora, I get that impression. You know, I I, I meet a, a lot of Ukrainians now and go to a lot of events. And there's this extraordinary part of the conversation where, you know, you come out of the event, you might go to the pub or something. And on the way from there, it might be just like a five minute walk. They have this incredibly intense exchange about who's been killed, who's been injured, who's at the front, how they're doing, who's missing. And they just exchange this sort of intense packet of information um which is contains extraordinary misery extraordinary suffering which they should not have to be going through but they kind of exchange that and when they got that out of the way then we talk about whatever it is you know resilience propaganda russia and then you know then you're into all the topics trying to understand it and trying to figure out how to take action because again Conversations with Ukrainians are very often quite action oriented, and it's it, it's absolutely extraordinary to see that sort of happening, and and tragic as well. Yeah, I mean, and it is. I mean, and even I mean, for example, in that attack that I was referring to, uh, uh, there were several fatalities, including a mother and her uh, eight year old daughter, uh, who it seems they were sleeping, uh, and, and so we're surrounded by by this, and and I think when you say action. That is, that's the key, you know, I mean, without action, you, you fall into despair. Uh, you fall into the victim story, which is what it seems that the entire nation of Russia is. They're the, you know, as I said, they're, they're the school shooters of nations uh, and, and they, they can't find any hope. And I, after these, or in between all these attacks here, the past several days, I was talking with friends about the Ukrainian word for victory, uh, <clears throat> peromohe. And we say it all the time, you're toasting, you know, to, to victory, to per, do per moha, za per moha. And I didn't know until the other day uh, what it actually means literally. And uh, uh, I saw Timothy Snyder was talking about this recently. Uh, the uh, you know, Ukrainian language, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, linguists that think that the original Indo-European language came from the land north of the Black Sea. And Ukrainian language, in, in some way, it's deeply rooted, like it's, it's sort of pure. It's not, you know, whereas English has so many different influences, it could be hard to see the meaning of a word. And so Ukrainian, uh, you can easily see kind of where the idea where the word came from. Uh, the word for hungry, you have to pronounce it with a guttural, it comes from the gut. So the word for uh, paramoha, victory, moha, moga is, is, is like ability or your, your, your might. Uh, like to be, or you know, like, yeah, basically the idea of to be. Um, but what you can do. And then para is like to transcend it. And so the victory means doing something that you are not able to do. Um, and, and, and not it's not like not something that you think you can't do. No, no, no. Something that you're not able to do. It's, it's a little bit miraculous and mysterious. 
and, and uh, friends here in Kharkiv were saying, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, you, you, you border, you get on the border of despair. I was talking with a friend who said, I don't know what anything means anymore, but that's where you have to have some kind of faith and you just take action and you just keep going. And that's how you get to, that's how you transcend your ability. Uh, but it's embedded in the very idea of victory uh, in, in the Ukrainian language. That's, that's a beautiful idea. And it kind of gets to the heart of, of um, Ukrainian resilience, which I think is an extraordinary thing. You know, we should be setting up institutes to study it, to dissect it and to try to figure out how we can get a little bit of that. You know, it's uh, it's an extraordinary thing, but not recognized. And that comes back to your idea. The windows are blown out. Some vision of reality is taken away and it forces you to focus on the detail in front of you. It forces you to focus on things that you perhaps had not observed before. Similar to, I guess, a COVID lockdown in that, you know, at weekends I'd go all over the place and not walk in the sort of woods and paths that are right next to my house. And suddenly you're forced to sort of focus and find value in, in things that are, that are nearby and perhaps simpler. Um, this is this is a good metaphor for freedom as well, isn't it? Because I think what this war has highlighted, at least for, for me, and I suspect for you, based on our previous conversation, is that we take so much of our freedom for granted. We actually take for granted the institutions, the checks and balances, and the culture, because it doesn't just exist in a constitution. Constitution is a piece of paper. We see that now with people... And this is going to, you know, maybe inflame a few people. We see this on extreme left and extreme right, um, quoting the Constitution all the time, and yet taking actions which are neither in the spirit nor even the letter of the law of the Constitution. They're violating this thing. It's clear that they don't live it, they don't breathe it. The conception of freedom that they have is, you know, to utter almost hollow words on the one hand, and then their action is to accrue wealth, influence, control status etc on the other to the detriment of other citizens and we, we see that happening all over the world the sort of selfishness um and the lack of the big picture ukrainians seem to be able to coalesce and say okay this is political and yet we can have a robust argument about it but here are some fundamental values and we're going to have to align on these we have to coalesce on these or they're really in danger of extinction. Do you, do you get that same impression? Absolutely. And I would say it's not, when we say Ukrainians, it's Ukrainians, but Ukraine, I mean, in, in this way, Ukraine is like the American idea of, of old, at least. Like there, there's so many foreigners who come here to be part of this or, you know, help from all over the world. I mean, like all the, so many of the guests you have and they're all Ukrainians in the sense of the freedom people. Uh, and, and so I think Ukrainian, and, and you even see that in the, in the society here. I mean, you have, you know, Korean, Muslim Korean Tatar defense minister, uh, one of the heroes of the Maidan revolution, uh, the anniversary, 10th anniversary of his death, uh, was just a few days ago. He was Armenian. Um, and so <clears throat> you, the idea is anyone who really embraces freedom, this is, this is the capital of it, the pole of it. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, again, you have in between the attacks, you have time to think about you know, life and everything and what's real. And one of the common phrases in America is freedom isn't free. It sounds nice. I, I sort of, I believed it. I saw the the great uh, Navy SEAL motivational speaker, Jocko Wilnick, uh, uh, posted uh, uh, the other day on Twitter, a picture of his gym and it says freedom. And he says, freedom isn't free. And when I saw that, it was after one of these attacks, actually it, we, and, uh, last Friday night, uh, some musicians from Lviv came here to Kharkiv and they were, it's still Christmas here. They celebrate till February. And they were uh, singing the uh, modern versions of ancient Christmas songs uh, in the underground uh, venue here in Kharkiv. Everyone was singing. And it was almost like a meditation because you repeat the words over and over. And, and I, knew, I realized that everyone around me, the hundreds of people in that room, soldiers, civilians, kids, old people, had been through hell these past weeks. And they're sitting there singing. And, and, this, and, and, and they're, 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 act, they're, they're living freely. And I realize that if we say freedom is not free, I think it's why we don't understand freedom so well, maybe now in America, it makes freedom into a commodity that either we're putting a price on it. And it also makes it something that we'll never quite attain. Like, oh, you know, freedom is some idea far away from us and uh, uh, or, or something that we have or own. 
it, 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 we, we can't live it if we think of it in that term. And so I began to realize maybe we should be talking, we should talk about the way of freedom. Freedom should be how we live, no matter what. Um, and, and so I want to erase that from my lexicon now, you know, phrase book, the idea of freedom is not free. I don't know what that means. And as long as we talk about it in that sense, we'll never understand it. And it'll always be something we never obtain um, because it has to be something, it has to be a spirit in our hearts. Um, and actually to live freely is free um, in a way. I mean, there's a cost for everything. I mean, and, and again, that's what the price Ukrainians are paying. If, because they had that revolution of dignity in 2014, now Russia is sending millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars of missiles a week to stop it. That's what a threat freedom is to 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 these scared, demonic, timid souls that want to control everyone. And those, you know, those who um, use the word freedom as a weapon, because there are, of course, those who have a maximalist version of freedom. Freedom is whatever I want it to be, you know, and you cannot limit my freedom, etc. Freedom, I think, is 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 clearly a a matter of checks and balances because your actions can very easily impinge on others and diminish their freedom. So it's it's not this sort of absolute or pure thing. But I think something you mentioned there about carols, about sort of culture, about commonality, this also is perhaps a sort of a lesser discussed part of what freedom means, is because to find commonality, in reality, you're not going to do it with your fellow citizens based on political abstracts. You're going to do it based on a set of shared values, and 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 culture is a significant one of those. Now, this is not to say you cannot be multicultural. This is in no way implying that you cannot have a diverse society, because, of course, Ukraine is incredibly diverse, incredibly tolerant. It's the only, pretty much the only country in the world, I think I saw you say, where there haven't been sort of pro-Hamas um, um, you know, marches, whereas there have been a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, support expressed for both Israel and for Palestinian civilians. You know, you can do that without weaponizing everything. But this role of culture, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, and it's something that Russia weaponizes. It's been a big focus of this channel to show how Russia weaponizes sport, weaponizes culture, dance, music. All of these are loaded into the barrel and fired out to try to control and influence people. How important do you think, then, is a certain sort of commonality of culture uh, in Ukraine, not uh, a homogenous culture, but a certain understanding that, uh, you know, we, we share these things and we're not going to weaponize it. And we think in particular, those who wield freedom as a weapon, uh, we see this on the extremes of politics and those who want to use politics to coerce and to create simplified solutions where, you know, things are potentially quite complex. They are using identity wars. They are using labels. They are trying to other their opponents. And they're using culture and identity as a critical way to do it. And without being controversial, this is both on the left and the right. And each of them are pointing at the other going, yeah, but they're doing it, they're doing it, they're doing it. It's a very dangerous technique, isn't it? Once you undermine that cohesion in society, then Russia, in a way, has won. It's already kind of got you. Yeah, the Russians love to yeah get everyone screaming at each other, and you can't see the truth. Then, and you know, I think politicians everywhere, except you know, there's there's statesmen. I, I don't like to denigrate the word politics. I mean, po North Korea doesn't have politics. We need politics, but there's a temptation for many politicians to 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 go into these culture. Uh, so and they're not wars because there's no missiles being fired, but uh, these uh, uh conflagrations and uh, the even here you have politicians that try to you know stoke things like that and not even here of course everywhere um but the difference here is that ukrainians are not so because they have a strong culture that's outside of political identity that you know it's like those things don't matter so much um and i think you know this is i realized in in thinking about america while i'm here in exile uh the you know so many people cross the ocean to go to the u.s for centuries in large part to get away from something like this from from the wars of Europe and the conflict between East and West. And besides, you know, with the major asterisks of our civil war, which, you know, uh, so many deaths uh, and, and and slavery and all the problems we've had in America, uh, we haven't had wars like this, you know, on our soil. Uh, and, and so you could say, okay, that makes sense. But in leaving 
these places uh, and whether it's, you know, the slaves who were forced and, and violently cut off in their roots or people who chose to leave uh, because of the violence here, uh, you know, we, we, we've lost our roots in America. And I've realized here, especially in like Ukrainian, the way they celebrate Christmas, which they maintained in the West, the Soviets, they can Kharkiv uh, and Kiev, uh, the Soviets were pretty successful destroying traditions. They got people to celebrate New Year's to some vapid holiday. Um, but now all that's coming back, as I saw with people coming from the uh, west of Ukraine to, to here, and the people in Kharkiv know their traditions now. Uh, they've been motivated to study it. And, uh, you know, but in America, we've lost, after generations, you know, you come from wherever your family comes from, you start to lose these traditions that were developed for thousands of years. And it makes us very isolated and lost. And, you know, I think, and probably we talked about this before, but I mean, you know, society, like, there's very little crime on the ground here in Ukraine. You know, the threat is from the missiles, from the mad Russians. Um, but, uh, and I remember a year ago in Kharkiv when there was no electricity, you know, at night there was no, there were no lights. Uh, I never was concerned about walking the streets that someone was going to rob me. They, 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 because they have, the, there is a culture. There's a, there, there's a sense of respect and, you know, freedom is really a dance. It's, it's, it's a dance. You, 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 you figure out how to, you know, how to operate within society. And, uh, and and there's a politeness and um and and I think that is I, when I look at the rituals of Ukrainian Christmas I, I see that as one of the keys in the hearts it brings people together and they celebrate it over and over again just chanting these singing these words together and just even that act of being together um, it's not centered on television or anything else it's it's actual lived culture and experience uh, and in the ritual and 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 there's something sort of mystical and very powerful to that. Um, and and I, I hope more people will, I think, well, I think we need to study that uh, to examine our own problems with isolation in America. And it's, it's very urgent because Russia is the extreme example of social isolation. You know, so everything's so broken since 1917, uh, traditions, culture, religion, church, everything. Uh, and, and you see what happens with an extremely broken society. Uh, again, that's, it is this, like the school shooter mentality. I'm going to destroy everything. And I think in America, we really, I think we can, this is why I hope um, when Americans look to nations like Hungary or they, they stand fine in solidarity with small protest movements around the world, they're missing the key here on how we could really reawaken our culture. Uh, Ukrainians could teach so much uh, uh, to, to Americans about um, how you can be tolerant and traditional, um, uh, even in the most extreme of circumstances. And in our format, we, we're going to cover a number of things um, to give an impression of what's going on. The next on the list is kind of frustration. And I'm going to I'm going to throw one out there because it relates very much back to the scary moment, which is the sort of missiles. I'll share my scary moment as well, because I think scary moments are different when you're you know not on the front line. <laughs> but um, the frustration must be that in the recent attacks, especially in Kiev. Now, I know in Kharkiv, there are really not sort of the quantity of patriot batteries and so on that you would get around uh kiev and lviv you know this is, is less covered but then it's less at risk um the percentage of shaheeds the percentage of missiles that are getting through has gone from being sort of 80 90 percent shot down uh say before christmas um that ratio is getting worse as it were uh in in, in ukrainians terms and this must relate back to the impasse uh, both in the EU and the US about providing munitions and funding uh, to Ukraine. I think there's slightly less limitations there because individual governments in, in, in Europe and especially the UK can uh, you know, make uh, independent decisions and, and send you know, what, what they've got. Uh, but this must be a frustration that lives are being lost because of, and I'm going to throw that out there, polit political gains for want of a better word. Yeah, Jonathan, it's a huge frustration, and it's something that it's been a frustration. I mean, throughout all this, but you know, especially going back uh, to September, uh, when uh, President Zelensky was in Washington, September twenty first, he was asking for long range weapons. The United States sent a few. The attackums, as soon as Ukraine got the attackums, they used them very swiftly and adeptly and precisely. And then no one even talked about it. The press doesn't talk about it. There's no pressure in Washington to send more. And we had all those months while Russia was preparing and stockpiling. Uh, for what the hell they've begun to unleash uh, from December 28th. And, uh, you know, we just keep going to this, you know, giving Russia all the time in the world to prepare. And, you know, I think if 
like and even in and this is where things get clouded in our political screaming matches but even in in the proposed spending package for ukraine uh there's no decisive tool there there are no decisive there is no decisive tools package for victory it's it's just life support uh like a hospice type of package and uh there you know there there's a sense of always protecting kiev and i've realized lately that Maybe it's, I, don't, I don't think it's a cynical. Uh, I, Kiev is like a Disney Disney World for, for for foreign politicians. You got some trouble with the polls back home. You want to look statesmanlike? Go to Kiev. It's safe right now, pretty safe, uh, thanks to the Patriot missiles and some other things. And uh, you know you can get your photo shoot. Uh, and and uh, it's like Disney World for them. Uh, but here in Kharkiv, uh, there's no Patriot missile battery. Uh, almost every time when there is an attack, it happens before an air raid alarm. Uh, you, the only thing that really could defend the city is something like the Patriot missile battery. And imagine if you said, you know, what, what, imagine the signal of strength that would send to say, look, OK, fine, we can debate later whether or not we give Ukraine long range weapons to hit Russian bases deep in, in Russia. Which we can talk about what Ukrainians are doing on that score. But we're at least going to defend. We're going to say you cannot bomb the hell out of the civilian city or any city such as Kharkiv. And we're going to send Patriot missile batteries here to defend the city. And um, they don't want to. Uh, There's a combination of motives, but it's a fact that they don't want to. And I, uh, there was a, I had a conversation with a prominent reporter from a prominent publication who was here uh, briefly uh, last week. So very bravely for, to be here at this time. Um, and the reporter said, uh, uh, you know, it's just too bad uh, while drinking a nice coffee. Uh, it's just too bad um, that the people here in Kharkiv uh, haven't faced the reality that the city's lost. And, and and I've suspected this for a while, that there are many in Washington, because they're out of fear or other motives, sometimes profit and money, that they don't really care. They, this is all little chess pieces. Let's let Putin have someplace like Kharkiv. We can have a negotiation. These people have never read their history. They don't realize you know, they know what happened in the 1930s. Let's let him have Kharkiv. And then Putin sees that they're accepting this fact. And so he begins to try to Bakhmut this place or Mariupol it. It's going to take longer because it's a huge city. But that's what that's what's been happening here these past weeks to make this an untenable place. And uh, and so, you know, I see that. I mean, Russia is the enemy, but they're also I mean, and many people in official Washington, both Washington and Moscow are waiting for Ukrainian spirit. I don't know why. I hope you don't see this same as my screen. I don't yeah, know no, I see that as well. That's uh, completely inappropriate, I, isn't it? I don't. That's a Microsoft thing, I guess. I have no idea. I have uh, no idea where that's come maybe from. Maybe there's some little hacker in this thing. Uh, but uh, I am only 30 miles from, from Mordor. Um, that people in Washington and Moscow are both waiting for the Ukrainian spirit to break, starting in places like this. And I, I, we can tell them very clearly that it's not. I mean, even here, you know, as I, as we were talking about, the spirit is very strong here. Uh, but this is a frustration that they still don't believe in the Ukrainian spirit. And I even suspect, like, you know, we keep hearing of the delays of the F-16s. So last summer, uh, it was, okay, F-16s will, uh, from Denmark and a few other places, will be in Ukraine by the end of 2023. Uh, and then in the fall, they said, oh, March. And it keeps getting pushed down the road. And sometimes they use the argument, oh, Ukrainians, you know, they're slow. We know that that's, you know, not true. I mean, they have motivation and they have competence. And I suspect that they don't want F-16s here until there is some kind of partition. And they, they said, oh, well, probably by March, there'll be, you know, Ukraine. And they, they, they still can't believe that Ukraine can hold on. Uh, now it's 702 days of this. They still can't believe it. And that's very frustrating. And that that that's uh, that that is uh, the frustration I was going to bring up. And, and actually, I am going to combine my, you know, the, the scary moment with with the frustration because it's the same. It's the realization that this is not just inertia. This is not just the drip feed is not accidental. It's not a result of the pressure of politics, uh, lack of press interest, etc. No, it's it seems to be a strategy. And I think my scary moment was reading the story in the Kiev Post where they demonstrated what kind of advisors 
are on a regular basis in the uh, you know in in the national security uh, team or, or giving or feeding in information or feeding in a mindset to the US national security team um and then to take that name one in particular Samuel Charuk to to look at him then he's very well considered in geopolitical circles he's one of these realists etc but then to go back and look at his record of publication because he's quite prolific at publishing in the uh, foreign policy type press, even the mainstream press. And I deconstructed his narratives. And of course, you know, he's a very eloquent, very sophisticated writer. Um, but when you boil it down and parse the language down, it is almost undiluted Kremlin bullshit. And then to realize that it's him who is actually feeding this mindset into the national security team as a, I won't say who it is, but I did approach somebody who is is one of the world's leading authorities on this. He says, yes, but that mindset has fertile ground within the national security team. It's what they want to hear. They want to hear that Russia is indivisible, eternal, etc., that you cannot defeat it. So it seems this sort of defeatist mindset has been baked into a strategy which is not articulated uh, fully, but is understood. And this phrase, as long as it takes, is just a useful fig leaf to cover up for inaction and actually quite a pernicious strategy underneath. Yeah, pernicious is, is the word. And, and, you know, we can be pernicious also, you know, by acts of omission, you know, maybe some people that are not intent, you know, trying to be evil, uh, but, but, but you become cowardly then if you're ignoring uh, the the great challenge of our times. And I think a lot of this comes down to, you know, the idea of freedom. Uh, and I think, you know, this is from talking to that foreign reporter here in Kharkiv and then talking with friends or old friends or colleagues in Washington and other places. There's this idea. And I think that if we could break through the filter on this. The world would like especially the freedom loving Americans would really wake up to the reality of Ukraine. There's this idea, okay, you can be free, but keep your cute little freedom in check. You know, you don't need freedom that much. Uh, this is what the people of Hong Kong have been told. Um, uh, you know, you can keep your commercial freedom, um, uh, buy stuff, but, uh, but, but, but th th this, this uncontrollable spirit, keep that in check. And that's what Ukrainians are, you know, that's why they're, they're so unusual even to many in the West, because they really insist on uh, being free so much so that they'll take bullets and, and face missiles. And, uh, you know, I think when I see President Zelensky in December when he was in uh, Washington, you know, I, I think, you know, we, they, they're talking about aliens a lot in Washington now. It's probably to do anything but to have to address this moment right now. Other things are possible, too. But I think, you know, when I, when I watched the video of Zel President Zelensky interacting with Republicans and Democrats in Washington, he was like some kind of alien to them because here's someone who actually really believes everything he's saying. He, you know, he he's asking for things that that he's actually going to use to, you know, to 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 say to, to to do what he promises to do because he has no choice. And um, someone who's so earnest and so insistent on this idea of being free and not being controlled, that is so foreign uh, to what we've gotten used to uh, uh, in, in the U.S. And I think, you know, th th it goes back to this, you know, we say freedom's not free. We don't know what it is. Uh, Ukrainians do and, and, they'll, and they'll die for it. Uh, and I wish that yeah, this would. You know, th this should inspire the world. This should inspire people to, you know, maybe we have to think more about this, but, you know, if I, get more involved in your local neighborhood or government or, so, you know, get, get to know your neighbors. Um, you know, live, live, that's these things, that's what makes life rich is participating in it. And I think so. we've lost sort of that sense of agency and participation, um, especially in the U.S. And, uh, and many places throughout Europe. And I, this is, uh, so I, I, th I think that's why they can't, they can't comprehend, you know, why, you know, why do you so much insist on being free? You know, why, why do we have to do this? And uh, that, that's a fundamental problem. And then, you know, as I mean, you know, Henry Kissinger said, you know, the world needs Russia uh, in, in the global equilibrium. And there's just this. I mean, Russians don't need Russia. I mean, let's turn that on its head. The world doesn't need Russia. Russia does no benefit for its own citizens 
whatsoever. Uh, and uh, I think that that needs to be reassessed. I mean, this this idea, because we discussed it last time, I think this is an incredibly interesting, important idea. Ukrainians, because of their circumstances, but also because of their historical context, they seem to live and breathe freedom through action. Freedom is not something that's passive. It's not just something you talk about, write about, or put a T-shirt on, or just go on a demo, and then you've ticked the box and done it. It seems that Ukrainians, you know, your 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 measure of freedom, your freedom index is what have you actually done to improve your neighborhood, your city? And, you know, you build up those components and, and, until it comes to national scale. But you have to demonstrably be taking part in something. Um, it seems to me, and I love to hear your, your views on this, that we need a new definition of freedom. And Ukraine actually has one. And it relates back to ancient Greece, as you pointed out, the actual concept of democracy being something you have to be you have to be an active citizen. Um, we have this concept of virtue signaling. So if you talk about various, you know, charitable causes, but do nothing to perpetuate them, you're virtue signaling. I think we need a concept here of freedom signaling because there's so much of that going on. People who talk about freedom, 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 but they don't define what that means and what they're doing to enhance it and increase the sum total of freedom in the world. Yeah, and especially if they're if they're yelling about freedom, you know, they, 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 if if you're not living freely, they, you got to start with yourself, with your own heart. And uh, uh, this is, you know, I mean, here I see this. Uh, like, I just uh, I, I'm I'm training with some friends here for a hundred kilometer run. Uh, we can't say where it'll be yet, but it's a way to we want to do everything we can to show the world. Like you can, you can excel, you can live, you can even find ways to be your, your, the best version of yourself as a Ukrainian musician, uh, Taras Mantitala says, be the best version of yourself for tomorrow. You can do that even in this hell, even with this uncertainty, because we all have uncertainty in life here. It's just magnified and, you know, <laughs> you know, death is closer in a way, but everyone has this and uh, you can do it. It's a choice you make. Uh, and so I've been training you know, running through the ruins and not knowing any moment when uh, you do run faster. You just hope that your emotion will make you maybe safer. But uh, uh, and so, you know, when you could easily just give up and, and you know, or I think of all the people that show up to work when their building is, you know, their, their apartment is partially destroyed or their office or their shop is, they could take a mental health day. And you do. You need this time. But you also they, you you make a choice to to, to, to not become a victim and, and not to give up. And but this, you know, the, the pull of Russian culture whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I do, I ask myself, like, had I never been to Ukraine? Uh, what, and this is a scary question for me. What would I, what would I think, you know, about all this? And would I be saying some of these crazy things that, you know, and, you know, I love Dostoevsky and, um, and, and Russia, Rimsky Korsakov and all this ideas of Russian, uh, you know, Imperial Russia. And, he, uh, the mayor of Kharkiv said the other day, because, you know, here, everyone's speaking Russian, you know, especially before the full-scale invasion. Russians colonized these places in the same way, uh, you know, not to bring up old things, but, you know, like Dublin is an English-speaking city, but it's still Irish. Um, and, and, but even the pull of Russian culture was very strong here in, uh, in Kharkiv. And, um, uh, Sorry, so, uh, I'm just checking because I hear unusual noise. Anyway, I don't see any reports yet. Not a not an uh, air, just, air alert or uh... no, it's just something else. Um, so, but the mayor of Kharkiv uh, yesterday, you know, after two years of this, he had some epiphany, and he said uh, that he was in no hurry to get rid of Russian names uh, um, on street. You know, there's many like, for example, one of the streets that was bombed the other day was Pushenska Street after the Russian poet, and. Uh, the mayor said this uh, yesterday, uh, until yesterday, the day before when the big attack happened there, I was in no hurry to change the name of Pushinska Street. I, like many of Kharkiv's residents, have always felt that Pushkin is not about modern Russia, not about the reality that the Putin regime is trying to impose. Uh, you know, Putin is using the greatness of historical figures for his own benefit. But after the enemy struck horrific blows against our city, taking the lives of innocents and turning houses into ruins, we see the real price of such decisions, the real price of even accepting any bit of Russian culture. 
uh, then the mayor, uh, Turkov, he, he, he proposed naming the street after 18th, an 18th century Ukrainian philosopher, uh, 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 Sk Skovoroda. And uh, the mayor continued, he said, Skovoroda's philosophy of life and freedom was fundamentally opposed to imperial ambitions. So here we begin to see this awakening, you know, that's happening here. Um, and this is the thing that has, you know, that, that you know, we have to has to be shared around the world, you know, that this fundamental two different principles of uh, freedom and dignity, of tyranny and control. Um, and there's a lot of psychology that goes into that, but that's that's what this is about. That's what this fight is about. And uh, the last area, I think, well, it'd be good to get sort of, you know, that sounds like a fairly inspirational moment there because we had a rubric here to sort of cover inspiration. But going back to the first thing we said uh, in in this episode, and you talked about a clash of um, ideologies or a clash of of, of uh, you know, a very different way of looking at the world, you know, one based on unfreedom and one based on on trying to improve and maximize freedom. There's another layer to it, though, isn't it? And it's a systemic layer as well, because what you've also got is a concept of rule of law. We happen to believe that rule of law is a way to maximize freedom, or at least it's a tool that allows you to uh, create a society that has a better probability of being productive, creative, economically, culturally, and so on. And it's not perfect, doesn't always work out that way. And rule of law is open to many interpretations. But generally speaking, you've got a rules-based order. Russia does not represent that. It represents a tearing down of rules. It represents the use of personal power networks it's it's completely unwritten and it's based on i would say a hierarchical structure not administratively but based on power understanding where you fit in terms of power relations seniority prestige status and then all resources are essentially distributed based on how powerful you are you know in the west clearly we know that if you're wealthy how you can accrue power through wealth in Russia, it's always seemed to me it's the reverse. Wealth is 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 something that uh, which is almost a privilege that you acquire through establishing your power, and you do that through nepotism, network. You do that through the willingness to project force and violence as well. So we're we're talking about an entirely different way of organizing the world, organizing society, organizing resources. This, I think, is not understood. I mean, how, in your view, if you think that's a correct interpretation, how do we get this idea across to US politicians of every different stripe that this is a fundamental fight for the values that make our societies, I would say, more forward looking um, rather than Russia, which Ukrainians will tell you, looks back to a very dark age in human history? Well, uh, Jonathan, I think there's looking at one word and how it's translated uh, in Russian and Ukrainian can, can can give us a great window into this. Uh, you know, Dostoevsky had the famous book, Crime and Punishment. And the word, I don't speak Russian, so I won't pronounce this well. I, maybe we talked about this. But the word for crime in Russian is uh, uh, prestunelina. Prestunelina. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So, so what it means, um, literally, stepping, going over, stepping over the line, and the line is just you know, in, in the case of Russia or any tyranny, the line who is decreed from on high. There's a line. Don't step over it. Don't question it. That's that's if you if you if you question it or step over it, you've committed a crime. In Ukrainian, the word for crime is zloch. I want to get it right. Zlochinist. Zlochinist. Which means that which is evil, zlo is evil, and so this is why Ukrainians, you know, I mean, they, you know, they they don't always follow rules, you know. I mean, they're, you know, whether it's curfew or whatever, you find your ways to, you know, survive. Part of that comes from Soviet uh, heritage. You had to find ways to survive, uh, and their deep desire to always be free, fiercely free, uh, the wild, you know, the Decapoli, the wild fields, the wild east of Europe. Uh, 
But the idea for crime in Ukrainian language is something that's evil. Don't do evil. Don't slaughter civilians. Don't take over someone else's city. It's very simple. It's in our hearts. For Russians, it, that's not that's it's it, that's not there, and it's certainly been lost, uh, you know, since the advent of, of communism. And uh, it's all about stepping over a line. And I think this is something that we can use to understand how fundamentally different these two societies are, and how we're all in the spectrum in between these two extremes. Because I think in America, we, I mean, you know, sort of we have we wrestle with our puritanical heritage, like ah, uh, let's burn every everyone we disagree with. Uh, to to something more noble, um, and and this is where we really, lest we collapse into some kind of terrible you know Russian like society, we we really need to to take heart and look at this. And you know with the Ukrainian method, yeah, there's a need then to be more careful and make sure you have structure and rules, and institutions, and and that's a process they've been working on since 2014. Um, but fundamentally, uh, very di- very different. And so we need to decide where which side do we want to err on, um, in our own political life. That's extraordinary, isn't it? So one has almost like an inbuilt sense of morality. So if you are committing a crime, you're aware that you're transgressing, not just something that's like written down or because some powerful guys told you, you're 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 committing something far more fundamental that's sort of universally um, accepted. Whereas in Russia, I mean, this is I'd never thought of it that way. And I think it's absolutely enlightening. In Russia, of course, a crime can be can be anything. A non-crime can be anything. It really depends. It depends on the definition, and we know that it depends on the definition of those who hold power. So people take their cue from. Okay, well, if powerful are doing that, then it's not a crime. There's no moral framework there, and many people have been wondering. You know, why are there millions of Russians now born in the diaspora? Uh, uh, and there are many more within Russia who might not be against the war, but they don't want to die, etc. But we've seen really very little, very low scale uh, protest, uh, barely any at all. And we've seen very little organization. Now, you know, Russian emigres were far more active in organizing politically in the 19th century. I mean, obviously, some of those movements were violent. Some of those movements were, were quite unpleasant. But you did have a lot more... Uh, activity going on and 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 some civic activity as well what peter pomerantsev has pointed out is that the german diaspora during the second world war were far more active in fighting the nazis uh, and it's it's rarely covered but they were far more active in in in, in joining in with their host countries in fighting the regime that they'd escaped from uh, this is terrifying that putin's uh, system his propaganda, which of course is also built on Soviet repression and what came before, it's terrifying how effective it is at really controlling people's actions or inaction, even when they're not directly, uh, you know, under threat from you know a KGB officer coming, uh, you know, in the dead of night knocking on the door. Yeah, I mean, and it makes you. I mean, it, it instills this idea of hopelessness in people that you know what. what what can you know this problem is too big to change so you know what can we do and uh and and you know i, I that's i think we really have to be on guard against that mentality for for all of us uh when we see you know our our political discourse in the in, in the states and i think um uh, we need some we need some big awakening and i i really think i mean the only way this is going to if we want, if there's going to be victory for Ukraine within a reasonable time before the whole country bleeds out, we need Ukraine needs, the world needs, the free world needs long range weapons from the United States. Without that, it's bleak. And the only way that happens, and this is both encouraging and terrifying, the only way that happens is if we have a fundamental cultural change in Washington, which means it has to happen throughout the country. Uh, so, in some sense, I see that there's a great moment for this because there is so much frustration in in American life. And then that's why you see people running toward the candidates that harness that frustration, you know, on the left and the right. Uh, but but people are looking for something that they know that something's not right uh, and, and they deeply want it to change it. Um, but we don't have mechanisms to talk with each other. And, uh, and so uh, this is going to take I, I think the answer has to come from Ukraine and somehow it ha- it's going to take some some eye-opening experience. You know, the other day, 
uh, Ben Shapiro, popular American commentator, brought Elon Musk to uh, to Auschwitz, and Ben is trying to wake Elon up, you know, to support Israel and to understand the th- the genocidal threat that they face. Uh, uh, by the way, genocide was a term coined by a lawyer from Lviv during the 1930s and 40s, and so Ben brought Elon Musk to Auschwitz to wake him up. They're in Poland, which is right next to Ukraine. This actual existential battle is happening here, and they just ignore it. And I, I had emailed Ben in December, trying to reach some of these people to get them to pay attention. A, this is an interesting story. You know, you got great stories of courage and heroism uh, every day, and you're totally ignoring it. Uh, and so much of our podcast and media, from Joe Rogan to everyone. And so I emailed Ben and I said, as you meant, alluded to earlier, the only country I said, Ben, are you because he supports Israel as a Jewish guy? Are you aware this is the only country, major country in Europe, without a single pro Hamas protest? Because they they recognize the evil, and uh, and and he said, oh, I had no been, I had no idea. Oh, maybe I should pay attention. And so I thought there was a crack of opportunity, uh, but then they come all the way to Poland, and you know, I, Ben's trying to get Elon to wake up, and I'm trying to get both of them and others to to wake up. And still no, but I think if we could find if, if someone in America, thoughtful and honest, would say, look, I've I've been wrong about Ukraine. Um, I was believing all the propaganda because I I understand. It. I mean, as I said, if I had never been here, what would what would be my information points? You know, and I very easily could be someone saying, you know, I loved uh, Dostoevsky and all this. Like, oh, you know, this, this who what is this Ukraine startup? Um, uh, by the way, a country that had a constitution with separation of powers in 1711, uh, uh, and so so much of this history has been ignored by the by the imperialist and uh, by the tyrants. Um, and so, anyway, that, that that's my hope, and that's what I try to you know, still trying to do every day. And of course, if they some, would have flown in. I don't know if they flew into uh, Warsaw or uh, Zhesha, which is where I I flew into to to get to Ukraine. But you come into the runway. And you suddenly realize there's this moment where you're like, you know, I'm going to use an expletive here. You know, he's like, fuck me. The, the, the runway is lined with Patriot missile batteries. I think I counted about eight in Zheshaw, just, you know, around the runway in the airport. And it suddenly makes it extremely real that you're on the front line between rule of law societies uh, and and something dark, you know, that is that is that is over the horizon, uh, something threatening uh, to come back again to what you said before, they would have seen that. And I, I don't see how that can but fail to make a, an impression. Yeah, it's. I mean, I think we, we, we blind ourselves to this, but, you know, this is why, for example, I talk with friends in Sweden. They're, they're, they're waking up. You know, we heard this, you know, time to get ready for civil defense. We're hearing this in the UK. The UK, by the way, you know, the UK is so beloved here in Ukraine because of the consistent support. And even most recently, trying to give Germany some way to get the long range tourist weapons here without Germany having to think about it too much or, you know, and uh, so the UK is great. But uh, countries are starting to wake up and say this could happen, you know, if, if the more that this could spill over. And uh, this is the and, and then this goes. Through, so. We got to, the Russian propaganda knows this and they delight in this. And, you know, every time Ukraine has a great success, it gets obscured, right? So last week, uh, Ukraine took down with it, you know, so they MacGyvered it as best I could tell, took down two of Russia's most prominent airplanes that are used to orchestrate attacks. And uh, one of them is worth $330 million. That's a major thing. Uh, and then we have the story of this plane that went down the other day. Uh, there's a little murky detail, but you know everyone in the press immediately takes for granted. Uh, oh, there are Ukrainian POWs on the plane, and in all and you know uh, as we talked about, Lavrov is in the UN. Oh, we need investigations, and even I, when I, I speak in my daily report on WGN it's for Chicago, and people are asking me, what do you make of this? You know, th- should there be an investigation? And all of a sudden, if we don't realize it, we've been pulled into this uh, totally an alternate universe. No one's talking about Ukrainian success. And let's say Ukrainians did take that plane down. Well, then we have three of these major Russian planes, of which is only about two dozen of the, you know, the, the IL-76 and the, um, uh, the spy plane uh, total. That's significant. And, uh, and of course, Russia is going to want to try to obscure this and hide it. And so that's why they, they try to get us to look at some little minutia. 
um, and, and perhaps they did put you know Ukrainian prisoners of war on there. Um, uh, but but we we must realize they are doing everything they can to divert us whenever there is a success, um, as they did. It seems you know with their pals in Hamas. I mean, you know I always like to say, what would the headlines be if X, Y, or Z didn't happen? And and the headlines last fall should have been Ukraine. Wow, Ukraine is putting a hurt on Russia in the Black Sea. Um, the headlines now should be, um, you know, one year ago, Ukraine was in the Middle Ages. People were living by candlelight. It's hard to remember, but there was no hot water. Uh, blackouts most of the day. Uh, missile attacks every week throughout the country. This year, we have electricity, hot water, heat. It's, I mean, this and is a coffee, huge thing. coffee, clearly, as well. <laughs> coffee, yes, fine, crafted, filtered coffee. This is, and you know, everywhere you go, Jonathan, you see generators. They're at the ready, but they have not been used for the most part. And this is a success. This is what you call a triumph on the way to the big victory. And not only that, but we see Ukrainians with the limited resources are able to attack Russian energy infrastructure, including like that major oil terminal, a couple of them now. Yeah, um, the LNG terminal, and, and and there's multiple storage holders that are being hit on a near daily basis. I mean, it's an extraordinary strategy. Um, partly, it must be to try and regain the sort of media momentum that the media are uh, stubbornly sticking to what I would say is familiar narratives of stalemate, etc. Um, we should we should come on to this as the story evolves. I know we're reaching the end now, but the story of the down plane. Even on mainstream media, you had the BBC, you even had a guy on Times Radio, I'm going to call this out, literally starting his report, a plane has come down with 65 prisoners on board. There is not a scrap of evidence. There is not a scrap of photographic evidence uh, or any other evidence that this is actually true. And if there were prisoners on there, were they alive? Were they coerced or forced onto that plane? Is this a propaganda exercise? Were they already dead and they've just shoved some bodies in there? I mean, anyone who has studied the operations of the FSB and the sort of mechanisms of what they will do and the sheer barbarity in order just to spin a story, and that, that's happened throughout the last sort of 70, 80 years, um, the media seems to not have, don't be aware of any of that. I mean, I say that, I say media, I use these broad terms because there are individuals who are doing incredible work. You've got people like Luke Harding, Ed Lucas, they understand how all this stuff works. All right, Sarah David Rainsford, Satter and others. Was, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the, the mass produced media, often it, it's just taken off, you know, a Reuters feed and we know all about, we know all about Reuters and their sort of dodgy alliances with TASS. Um, that the mass-produced media that just churns stuff out and recycles, um, they, they have no context. They have no critical faculties. That's extremely dangerous. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this is, part of this is um, a, a lack of, of studying history and, you know, caught up in some kind of frenzy. But I think also the, there's a conceit of journalists um, they want to always be okay. Well, you know, the world supports Ukraine. We we're still impartial. It will, you know, it's like what Amnesty International does. You know, when they criticize, uh, when they had that strange report about Ukraine uh, over a year and a half ago. But they, oh, if I can criticize Ukraine on this point, I will look very noble and impartial. Um, I've even had uh, European journalists have, uh, from French media ask me, uh, you know, the fact you're there every day doesn't that um, doesn't that ruin your impartiality? I said, no, it makes me understand uh, the reality. And, uh, you know, and, and I don't just come, descend on this as a cute little game, you know, like this is a football game and we're just given some play by play. I think that's a lot of what this is. And um, and they end up becoming unwitting agents, hopefully unwitting agents of of this uh, regime of tyranny, which, by the way, if they were in that country, they'd be put in jail. You know, I mean, there's no freedom there. And I think as a journalist, you so you have to make it stand on freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom for all people. And uh, and so this is what well, we really have to be aware. You know, I, I see because I saw this the other day on the radio of being asked about the plane crash. And I, I put the brakes on it in my mind. I realized I was getting sucked into making this the main topic. And uh, the main topic is the great successes Ukrainians have had, which and we say, well, 
of course, Russia's going to do everything they can to win. So Ukraine, it seems, has taken out three, at least two, maybe three uh, of Russia's key planes. Um, this is extraordinary. In fact, Ukrainian, um, the intelligence branch of the Ukrainian military put out uh, a cryptic message, as they like to do the other day, suggesting uh, specifically that Ukraine is undertaking clandestine actions uh, to protect places like, and they specifically mentioned Kharkiv, from which I speak to you, because they don't have air defense from the West to protect the city. They don't have interest. The West is, is not interested in protecting it. It's been so horrible here, as I said, trying to turn the city into Bakhmut. Ukrainians are, okay, what can we do? And and there's evidence that on this plane, perhaps that they were uh, bringing warheads that would be used to attack uh, the city. Um, perhaps, we don't know. But Ukrainians said that that's that's what they're trying to do now. They're, they're taking out uh, with whatever they can, uh, the, the resources that Russia uses to unleash hell um, upon these cities uh, that are unprotected. And uh, so that is, and, and of course the Russians are going to try to obscure this and, and come up with some crazy narrative. And that, we just have to realize that and, uh, and not get sucked into it. And I think we'll pick up on that in, in, in our next episode. And this is the power of the uh, uh, unconventional warfare, hybrid warfare, and, and actually why that might uh, be the key to Ukraine's victory. I think we're probably sort of out of out of out of time there. And we'll we'll put some timestamps in the video so people can jump to the bits that most interest them. But this has been absolutely fascinating. I don't know what what you want to end with. I mean, what uh, what's the key question or the key thought you want uh, the audience to take away? Well, I think, Jonathan, uh, this this realization I've had uh, the past few days here, intense days, you, you hear the echoes of uh, even here, it, it, everything was calm now, but I thought I heard something and, you know, you're ready to, to duck uh, this realization that both Washington and Moscow are waiting for the breaking of Ukrainian spirits for different reasons and different motives um, for Washington. It's just it's a tricky problem. You know, will this go away? Um, and the more people can realize that, like anyone in America who admires a protest movement somewhere from Germany, California, Ottawa, whatever, just take a step back and, and look and see what's happening here. Because this is this is the epitome of freedom, the wildest form of it, in a way, uh, the purest form. And it is on the edge of being erased, not because people will surrender. They won't. But erased in blood of the people that are getting killed at the front lines um in the cities um and you know we're, we're I, we have american supporters that send money to buy drones uh uh every every week almost now to, to get to patch things up right to help guys at the front uh but unless there's something a big change and 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 just we have to realize you know very few people in washington are serious about this they, they say oh we're throwing money at it uh but without long-range weapons and the permission to use them uh this Ukraine will bleed, and as Ukraine bleeds, as people are starting to realize, uh, in 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 places where you never thought there could be war, like Sweden, they're realizing. So let's, let's try to wake up before it's before it's too late. That's an incredibly powerful thought and message to to take away there. Uh, I very much look forward to to this series. I think this is going to uncover not just like what's happening day by day. I think this is going to uncover so many fundamental ideas and hopefully galvanize people to contact the representatives and try and affect change because this is this is all our freedom uh, that's under threat and there's so much we need to learn from ukraine we cannot afford for it and its spirit to be erased joseph thank you so very much good luck stay safe and uh, i strongly advise people to follow your incredible reporting Jonathan, uh, thank you for everything you do. Uh, this is it's always no good to know here at the edge that there we have lifelines to the world of communication. So and you can follow our work at ukrainianfreedomnews.com. And every single day, Monday through Friday, since February 2022, I speak on Chicago's WGN radio. So thanks to them too, and uh and to Silicon Curtain as well. So Duzhadiakou, you're from Kharkiv, uh, the edge or maybe the center of the free world.